to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. Today, I'm joined by Kate Bendewald, owner and principal of Kate Bendewald Interiors. Kate has 15 years of design experience, starting in the commercial industry and then striking out on her own eight years ago. She also serves as a business coach for fellow interior designers through her membership program, Designers Oasis. And to top it all off, she was the co-host of the podcast, Designers Getting Coffee, with her friend and our friend of the show, Leslie Myrick. Maybe you were one of their great supporters of that show. Of course, it's not on air anymore, but the library lives. That's the cool thing about podcasts. <laughs> it's there forever, right? Now, Leslie, if you remember, reappear, appeared on the show both in the very beginning of the uh, show and the beginning of her business back in episode 37. And then she was on again more recently in episode 584, where she walked us through how she started her business up from the ground in an entirely new state with no connections or network. We are excited to have Kate on the show today because any friend of Leslie's is definitely a friend of ours, right? Now, like many of our previous guests, Kate struck out on her own as a designer for flexibility for her family. This was the motivator, right? And when I speak with designers who do this, I usually hear one of two stories. The first is that they really didn't care for their previous jobs or were at the very least ambivalent about the job they had. Something eventually happened, whether it was a move or a baby or a big life change. That was the catalyst to push them toward what they really wanted, which was operating their own firm on their own terms. But Another side to the story is those who truly loved what they did and just couldn't make it work after a big change, like having a baby. And that's where Kate is. But that's not how it was for Kate. She worked for a thriving commercial design firm prior to having children, and she loved it there. But like it does for many of us, motherhood threw a wrench into things. When Kate felt like she could no longer sustain the long hours and, t and the intense commitment to the design firm, she ultimately decided to strike out on her own, giving her the ability to spend more time with her daughter and actually maintain her own mental health. Okay, no joke. Wait to hear the story. But her design experience didn't prepare her for the business side of the business. That she had to learn on her, on her own the hard way. And today she's sharing her story, her difficulties and her successes, and how she stays focused on the big picture, even when it gets tough to do that. Before we get started with Kate, I'd like to take a moment to thank our show sponsor, My Doma Studio. My Doma Studio is your complete designer toolkit, the place for you to manage all of your projects from time tracking to communication to product approvals so that you can free your time to focus on your business and serving your clients. You can get started today and save 20 percent on your first three months at mydomastudio.com forward slash a well-designed business mydomastudio.com forward slash a well-designed business okay looking forward to sharing this conversation with kate with you hi kate thanks so much for joining me on a well-designed business today Hi, Luann. Thank you so much for having me. It's it's great to connect. I've been a, a longtime listener. Oh, that's great. I'm I'm looking forward to our conversation too. Of course, we talked about in the intro uh, that you are friends with Leslie and any friend of Leslie, I'm already on board. So there we go. <laughs> Perfect. Um, yes, right. So here's the thing. You come from a background in commercial design, working for a big firm where you're really asked to do the 50, 60 hour work weeks, right? Right? And it's like, you know, with with high level projects, I imagine, but it comes with with a responsibility. And I'm curious if you enjoyed it. 
But I understand from the letter that you wrote me that once you had your first daughter, that became like, this is not going to fly. So was it something that you really enjoyed and then realized, hey, motherhood, responsibilities, wanting to do this over here. And I'm not talking about if it was like, oh my God, I have to leave my job. I'm not talking about the drama of it. I'm just like, were you really, um, was it like a surprise that it was hard to manage that with childhood? Or did you always expect and know that that type of project and that type of work was not going to be suitable for family life? You see what I'm trying to get at here? I do. And that's a great question. You know, it was a bit of a surprise for me. Parenting was a, uh, smack in the face, (laughs) I think. (laughs) And so, um, the truth is, is, prior to having kids, that world of, of designing and for these really sexy projects in the commercial world, it was, it was so much fun and there was so much energy behind it. I worked with incredibly talented designers and I learned so much. And when my maternity leave was wrapping up, while I was sad to leave my daughter on a daily basis and she was going to daycare, um, it would take about six months for me being back at work where I was just like, well, I wasn't sleeping. <laughs> I was Man. exhausted. I was, um, you know, sleep deprived. And so it started to occur to me, like, I just don't think I'm cut out for, for this level of intensity, this grind. And it really did require that, you know, because of the the project schedules and timelines. Um, so things started to shift for me inside. And, uh, you know, I started to create a website in the evening hours after baby went to sleep and worked on sort of branding and kind of thinking about what would I want to do. And it was all sort of stirring inside. Um, but there, there was a moment when <laughs> I think it was my first performance review after, I came back from maternity leave and, and I wasn't hitting my deadlines and Mm. I just broke down crying. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. I'm not sleeping. (laughs) I like literally would come to work and stare at my computer. And I was like, what, what what am I supposed to, what am I even doing right now? I don't even know. I was, I was just beyond myself. So that's when it really hit me. Like, I think I need to, to kind of shift away from this. So we came up with the plan and I ended up you know, saying goodbye to that experience uh, and took away from it so much um, knowledge and friends to this day. Um, but it was a, it was an exciting time. So that's when I kind of shifted into doing my own work. And I was able to do that at a pace that uh, made sense for me. So uh, it was a surprise, to say okay. the least. Okay, so and, and I wanted to understand that, because sometimes we are just counting the hours until we can leave a job. And we you know, maybe it's because we're going to make a move in location or a family move change like having a baby. And, and other times it's that what you just said that you enjoyed it and you loved it and it was kind of a surprise that it wasn't manageable with the baby yeah absolutely yeah and 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 I want to talk about that um awareness and and coming to grips with it but before I do it occurred to me I know that you run your own residential firm now but if you were to project yourself to running a commercial firm. You spent, you know, eight or nine or 10 years doing it. So I imagine you probably could envision what that would entail. Can you think Mm -hmm. about any types of initiatives or protocols or processes that a commercial firm could put in place that would make that transition for a woman who chooses to have the baby and really does prefer to stay in that kind of firm? Any ideas come up in your mind there? Yeah, I, absolutely. I'm so glad you asked this. And it turns out that that same firm, there was another um, uh, young principal who, after having her baby, she recognized a strong need uh-huh. for that and did that exact same thing within that particular firm. And I, knowing her, imagine uh, that went really well. But, you know, first of all, for me, I was hiding my... Uh, sleep deprivation. I just Mm. thought I'm just going to work over here in my little corner. Nobody's going to notice. And I think if I had reached out sooner to somebody and asked for help and just said like, Hey, this is happening, you know, and tried to understand what my resources were and what my options were, um, that it could have been a lot more, uh, collaborative and pro and proactive. Um, so that was something that I just needed to, I didn't recognize my options there at that time. So, 
if you're in a position like that, I think asking for help and talking to somebody that you trust is, is important. Um, but I think firms in general, you know, just this firm in particular was really incredible. They were when, when I had my baby, I had like three baby showers within the firm. (laughs) They were so generous to me. They were so excited for me. Um, and it just felt like a real home and community, but the truth was I was getting a workload that I couldn't maintain. Um, and, uh, you know, for somebody who's not getting sleep and who can't focus or concentrate, mm. they're not going to hit their deadlines and hit their responsibilities the way that they're expected to. So, um, you know, I think just having a mentor or somebody um, that's higher management or higher level that can check in with those new moms or even new dads for that matter. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially, you know, uh, and parenting could look different for a lot of people. It can be somebody that's fostering, somebody that's uh, just adopted children or or taking care of an ailing parent or whatever the case may be, but just somebody that can check in and say, hey, how are things going? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think would be a great strategy. And did you also, uh, did you have any element of postpartum depression in that, Kate? Or was it really just sleep deprivation, which there's no such thing as just sleep depri- deprivation. <laughs> I get that. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I didn't, I didn't have uh, postpartum depression uh, from a traditional sense, but what I did experience was a lot of anxiety because I was trying to hide this sleep deprivation and hoping that nobody would notice. But I was just like, you know, I used to wait, I waited tables for years, which sort of informs how I do business today, but I used to get weight mares. Oh, yes, yes. Nightmares where these like, you're on the fifth floor, but all your p- tables are on the first floor. Yes. And you can't get down to them. Oh. So I would have like dreams like that, where it's like <laughs> that work was coming into my sleep and my dreams. And it was just all around uh, really impacting my ability to function on a day-to-day basis. And the result of that was a lot of anxiety. So, but as soon as I sort of wrapped up and walked away from that, it all <laughs> went away. So wow. I knew I had made the right choice for me at that time. And how long did you endure that? Was it weeks, months? What? How long did you stay before you said, okay, uncle, this is not healthy for me? Yeah. Well, it was, I want to say it was about six months after I had come back to work where I had that performance evaluation mm. that went terribly wrong. It was like, it was like, what's going on? <laughs> this is not I just case. asked you what time it was. Why are you crying, Kate? <laughs> yeah, and, and so it wasn't long after that, you know, I, you know, when a new mom breaks down crying in their interview and, or yeah, performance evaluation and says they're sleep deprived, uh, they're, they're not going to be quick to fire me (laughs) from, from probably a legal standpoint, knew that they, uh, needed to find resources for me. But, um, I want to say it was several months after that where I, um, I, I said, I think it's time for me to move on. So it was all, it was all fine and well, and, uh, it was, Bittersweet, but yes, yes. Well, you know, I've mentioned several times on the show how my one daughter, you know, suffered from postpartum and sleep deprivation and all the things. And um, I think until I know, forget what I think, I know until you, well, let, let me just talk for me again. Instead of, I know for me that I did not grasp the seriousness of it not even during it, but it was after the hindsight when she had come mm-hmm. out of it and was able to talk about it and then go back. And then I connected what I saw and heard in time with what she was telling me in present. There, mm-hmm. Unless you have been through it, I don't like, like when you're saying sleep deprivation, I have to tell mm-hmm. you, if I had not had this learning through my daughter, I'd be like, yeah, like we're all tired. No, it's a different sure. thing. It's a completely true level of sleep deprivation that you're talking about that has you as a puddle of mud in the office, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, it's like one night of bad sleep is one thing. Months yes. of ongoing yep. um, sleep where you never quite get to a, a, that deep mm-hmm. REM sleep that is nourishing to your body. Mm-hmm. Your body physically starts to break down. And because it happens over time, that makes it harder to recognize, I think, for the people experiencing it as well as their loved ones and certainly their employers. Yes, yes. uh, It it does take a level of self-awareness that 
I know looking back, I didn't have at that point in my life. Right. I agree. And, and as her mother, I didn't even have that awareness. And it's painful to think about that. I was like, okay, all mothers are tired. Pony up. You know what I mean? Like, you know, big girl panties, let's go. And it's just not that. And so, and so here you are, you have this position, you love the job. See, that's the other factor of it. You love it. You're, there's a part of you that's motivated that wants to keep it and wants to enjoy it again. But there's real obstacles for, to, for you to be able to perform and to do it on time and to do it well. And so that's a hard transition. That's a hard thing to come to grips with. So you explain that you were starting to, you know, piddle around at night and figure out branding in a website. When you decided to leave, you said, you know, relief, great. But it's a whole now another problem launching a business. This is no like, hey, I'm just going to eat ice cream and bonbons all day. <laughs> I did that for about a week. Though. <laughs> well, Luann, I'll tell you here, I remember very distinctly the turning point for me that made me go from like, I know this is what I need to do. I'm excited. There's also lots and lots and lots of questions, but I very distinctly remember going on a walk with my husband. Um, and we started talking about the finances of it and the nuts and bolts of like, well, what could I make if I were to work for myself compared to what I'm making now? And we just started like out loud as we're talking, you know, like, blah, blah, blah. If I charge this much per hour and I work this many hours a week, extrapolated over a year, I was like, oh, oh, wow. I think I can make this work and make a lot more money. And uh, that that certainly was the case for me, uh, not overnight, but uh, I think it was that understanding the potential to have a much higher income working for myself was the part where it's like, okay, I can wrap this up and I can pivot to working for myself without any questions. Okay. So I love that. So you actually have a conversation that is, I'm willing to work this many hours per week. I can earn this many uh, dollars per hour based on my experience and where I'm at. And we times it out and we see if it makes sense, right? Like we don't just quit our day job and think there's no plan, correct? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, that conversation was the starting point. And after that, it was pen to paper, creating a spreadsheet, looking at the, the low end possibility, the high end possibility. Um, and, you know, stretching and saving in other areas in order to make it work for our family financially. And did the two of you put any parameters on it in the sense that we'll give it X amount of months or whatever period of time. And if it doesn't result in X, Y, Z, we're going to have a serious conversation about pulling the plug or, you know, was there any of that sort or is just like, you know, we're going for it. Uh, it was pretty much we're going for it. And I can understand wanting to put that parameter around. And for some people that might make sense. So, um, I don't want to, you know, say that that's not the right approach. I just wasn't the, the approach we took. I, mm -hmm. I felt pretty confident that I could make it work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love it. Okay, good. All right. And so now you transition into owning your own firm. And as we both know, it comes with its own set of challenges. So where do you want to take the conversation, Kate? Do you want to talk about the types of things that maybe surprised you as a business owner that maybe you weren't even like the things, you know what I was called, the things I didn't know I didn't know. So here I am uh -huh. on a 10 year experience <laughs> commercial designer. I'm used to doing all these projects, you know, deadlines, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, whoa, <laughs> I didn't see that coming. Did you have yeah. those moments yeah. when you went into your own business? Countless. <laughs> <laughs> Countless. Um, which in a way is a blessing because if you do, if you are, you know, able to be aware of all the things you don't know, you might not be willing to take that leap. So um, in a sense, there's like ignorance is bliss and you just figure it out. But that's kind of my nature. That's how I was raised as very like, you just figure stuff out. So I, I took that approach uh, for sure. But, you know, Luann, I went to design school, not business school. And so even though I had the design chops for my experience working for, you know, my first job was with a small boutique designer in Austin and then later at the large architecture firm. So I had both experiences to compare and they were different and good, but I had no idea what a PO was or a bill of lading or a CFA, like none of that. Right. <laughs> I 
had to figure it all out for myself. Um, sales was another thing. I, and, and I can talk more about that specifically, but you know, I made a lot of failures. I had a lot of gaffes. I figured it out. There were not nearly the amount of resources available online then that there are today. Um, so, you know, for one thing, the, the sales piece was figuring out how to communicate my value to my clients and how to help them paint the picture of what it could be like working together and to help them cross to the other side to saying yes to working with me. Um, and, and while I had no problem getting clients, I was very fortunate to have good connections and, and be able to connect with people personally to have them take a chance on me. Um, there were many missed opportunities. I just looking back, knowing, you know, that first discovery call that you have with a client, not knowing how to handle that discovery call or what mm. to say or how to lead that conversation. So my very first investment in any sort of coaching uh, was with a sales coach who um, had a great course and one on one. And one of the things we did was actually record me on a discovery call and played that back and boy she picked that <laughs> up apart <laughs> i recently uncovered that recording in a in a dropbox folder and i just couldn't bring myself to listen to it <laughs> i was like i'm not gonna rehash that up so anyway that was a big piece for me was you know standing in my ground stand, holding that space for myself and my expertise and being able to convey that in a way that was confident but um not pushing she, you know, really sort of taking the client's needs and desires and putting that front and center and painting the picture for them and how I could transform their lives through the story of their home. So uh, that was my biggest and first investment. And to this day, it has paid off for me. So let me pull that um, apart a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So just from a technical standpoint, I know everybody's going to laugh at me. How do you record <laughs> your discovery? Because it wasn't like you weren't role playing. You actually recorded a real discovery call. Yeah. There's an app called Tape a Call that I used, and I oh. did ask for permission prior to that. Okay. Um, you know, I just said, you know, for internal purposes, nobody else will hear this, but it's, you know, f f just for myself. And she agreed. So I, I went ahead and recorded it. Okay. I had to ask that because when I'm working with designers, often we'll do like a role play, but you know, it's so bleh. like, you know, like you can't role play it. You have to be in the moment when the client says the thing, you know what I'm saying? And I love You're that. Right. So, okay. So you work with, with this sales uh, coach and the discovery call was uh, a pivotal learning lesson, it sounds like. Can you recall some of the things that maybe you would be able to share where somebody would, could identify, oh, that's something that I'm doing. I didn't realize it wasn't appropriate or, you know, wor you know whatever, right? <laughs> it's funny. I actually do remember a specific question that the, the client or prospective client had where, um, I, you know, botched the response and it was something so simple. You know, she was asking like, so do you have, a, um, connections to contractors and resources like that? And my answer should have been, yes, absolutely. I got you just total confidence. Um, and <laughs> just cause I was like, so <laughs> painfully <laughs> honest. I was like, well, you know, I'm just starting out and I'm building those relationships and developing, developing um. them, which was true. But also I did have a connect, a, a group of connections and, you know, it was just one of those small things where I wasn't yes. projecting the kind of confidence that I knew I had what it took to help this person with their, their project. So, yeah. um, and the other thing was just having a really like clear call to action. So today my call to action is crystal clear. First, I'm, you know, listening to the client for, um, to understand their needs from a scope of work, timeline, investment standpoint, all of those things, a personality, uh, lifestyle, you know, and, but then that's going to help me direct them to the right service. And right now we're only doing full service, but there was a period of time where I was doing designer for a day and e-design services. So once I could understand what it was they needed, then I could direct them to the, the right call to action. So for mm. me today, we're doing strictly full service. So my call to action to them is always let's book an in-person consultation. 
And the mistake before was trying to sell them on the whole process. (laughs) (laughs) Let's just get our foot in the door. Let's get to meet each other. This is a paid consultation. Here's what that would look like. Here's what you're going to get at the end of it. Uh, Here's the value that you can expect. It's really fun. There's no commitment when we're done for me or from you. Um, And selling that is so much palatable (laughs) than trying to sell somebody on you know, biting off the whole thing at once with just a 15 minute phone call. So once I made that shift and I started to realize my call to action needs to be much simpler, uh, my success rate went from like 20% to 90%. So, um, knowing your call to action and how to wrap up that discovery call has been just such an important part. Yeah, I love that you pointed that out because, you know, in my experience with Window Works, it's the same thing. I, when I when you call into Window Works and you say I'm interested in window treatments, draperies, awnings, I'm not trying to figure out what to sell you. I'm just trying to get my salesperson in your house. That's all I want to do, right? Mm-hmm. At the at the sales appointment, they'll figure out if they if the client is a right fit, if we're the right fit for the client and if there's products and services that we can, you know, then take the next step forward. And it reminds me of you know, even a car salesman, it's, you know, mm-hmm. he just wants you to test drive the car. That's all we got to do. Let's just test drive the car. Then we'll talk <laughs> about how much it costs, right? Yeah, so exactly. it's little by little. It's And I love that you have the clarity on understanding what your objective is for each part of your process. That's what it basically, from your, you your intake process, it's what is the objective of the phone call? What is the objective of the consultation? What is the objective of the proposal? What is the objective of the contract, right? It's like just slice it and dice it to exactly what it should be for that moment, right? Bingo. Exactly. (laughs) Love it. I love it. That's such a great thing. That's such a great thing to get clarity on, right? It certainly was for me. It it was, it just made that initial phone call so much easier. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's great because um, it's so funny because I often, people will say to me, oh, well, you know, I'm not good at sales. I, I don't this, I don't that. And the truth is, is that when you do break it down into little pieces, I, you know, I always use the marathon analogy. I'm not good at running a marathon. Well, are you good at running a mile? Because if you do that in a couple times in a row over six or eight or 10 months, you're going to be good at running 26 of them. <laughs> like, but if you just start yeah. out today and going to go 26 miles, no, you're going to say, I'm not good at running a marathon. So I'm not good at sales. Well, are you trying on the phone when you say hello to close a, you know, a $50,000 design fee project? Well, yeah, that's not going to happen, right? Absolutely. And my sales coach used a, 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 a different but also effective metaphor that helped me. And I realize we're not curing cancer here, but she came from a pharmaceutical sales background. So it was natural for her to use this. But I think we all we tend to get hung up on the term sales. But the truth is, if you have any intention to run your business, you have to be good at sales. Mm. And so you need to embrace it, you need to become comfortable with it. Um, and if you can really just shift your thinking from sales being like, I'm trying to put something onto someone and remember, first of all, they reached out to you because they need help Mm -hmm. and you have what it takes to help them solve their problem. And really good design can solve a lot of problems. We, that could be its own conversation, but she is the metaphor. Like if I have a drug for, to help somebody experiencing, or if you know, has cancer, it's my responsibility to share this, option with them so that they know what their options are. Selling is helping. And so that was a very simple shift for me to remember that I'm not trying to put something onto them. I'm trying to help them. And so, um, you know, now that seems so obvious to me, but early (laughs) on, it really wasn't. (laughs) Well, it's true. I always say the best sales are the win-win. I, I, I can convince you of something you don't want, but that's, that's not a good outcome for me or you. So the best sale is helping the person to get, have, own, achieve, accomplish what they want, right? Love it. 
And if they're what they want to accomplish is a beautiful home, you're in the perfect position to help them do that. (laughs) Right. So, And I also wanted to go back to, you know, when you use the example of do you have connections to contractors, trades, resources, and you were like, well, I'm beginning to establish that and all that. It struck me in that moment there because you said that you actually did have some, but you gave the other X, the other answer. It struck me in that moment there that you're almost like I say, there's no lie to detector on you here. We don't need to get to the letter of the actual reality, right? (laughs) So your actual letter of your reality is, I have some connections with some contractors and I can execute your project in that. But you went all the way down to, in your mind, I'm not sure that they're going to be my contractors in two years or three years. Is it my ultimate team? Is this all the ones I'm going to, well, I'm starting to establish those relationships, (laughs) right? That's what you did, right? I could hear it. Yeah. It's like, I have a contractor. That's all you need to know. (laughs) I find today with the designers that I work with that there's a tendency to over explain things right. and that's, that's been a huge like I I don't explain don't complain is my mo today <laughs> I love it don't explain don't complain okay so of course we do want to explain certain things we do want our agreements and our our you know clients expectations set but we the, don't over explain is so true so true yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Just keep it crystal clear and focused and, and to the point. Well, what I find in the over explaining when I'm working with people and helping them uh, develop their salesmanship skills is the over explaining is, you, you know what? I always use the analogy of when the baby says, you know, the kid says, you know, where do babies come from, mommy? Right. So, <laughs> right. The kid's three years old. Where do babies come from? My belly. Right. You don't go into Mm -hmm. this whole big thing. And when the kid (laughs) says, oh, okay," he walks away. So the client asks you a question or try, you know, whatever it is, you give them the honest answer. But you don't have to give them the six, you know, well, and then there's procreation and there's a little this and a little. It's just they come from my belly. And then if they need Mm -hmm. more, the contractor needs more. The client needs more. They'll say, but wait. How does it get mm-hmm. in your belly? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh-huh, and uh-huh. you can say, you know, the universe puts it there. Maybe that's good enough that time, right? Like the idea is is we give the truth and we say the truth, but we don't have to give every bit of it. And because it just overwhelms a client, it overwhelms a trade, it overwhelms anybody, right? You took the words out of my mouth. Mm-hmm. Over explaining is the fast path to overwhelming somebody. And when somebody feels overwhelmed, that puts them in analysis paralysis or decision fatigue like it makes it harder to make a decision yes i I love that over explaining leads to overwhelming it's true because there are certain things i want to make sure we're clear on this because i know kate that you're practicing this already what we're clear about is the things that we know they need to know to begin an organized and a well thought out project that the expectations are set. Those things, it's like we had on the show recently, April Jensen, Jensen, the rules of engagement, right? Mm -hmm. So those Mm -hmm. things that we know are the stick points, are the points that a project can go off the rails, are the things in our contract that we must have clear upfront agreement on. Yes, this does not fall into the category of over explaining, not just sign the dotted line, see you by, right? But it's it moves into the when a client asks you a question, like maybe you're in the design phase and they're saying, well, when what week is the foundation going to be, you know, laid on the design build? Well, sweetie, I don't really know that yet. And you you know, Mm -hmm. what you can say is the truth that comes after this project, after this process, right? Like the point is we don't Mm -hmm. then give a whole dissertation on the entire design build process, (laughs) right? Correct. Yeah. 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 I think I, I kind of look at it as drip feeding details. Yeah. So the level of detail that the client becomes aware of happens as the project and the design process progresses. Love it. That's a great way to put it. Drip feeding details. It's like the baby. Three-year-old, it comes from the belly. Uh Six-year-old, it's Uh this. Twelve-year-old's different. (laughs) You got to tell different levels of details for different levels of of kids. And so we sell the client different levels of details at different levels of the project status. Precisely. And I'm going to use that uh, 
example that you used for the future. <laughs> Where do babies come from? It's a, it's a great, great example. Right. I mean, how many times when your kids were little, you just give them a name. You're like, you know, well, I, I mean, the perfect is like, you know, why do I have to go to bed now? Well, because all kids go to bed at 730. Okay, great. I got my kid. I must go to bed at 730. See you. Bye. <laughs> right. Yes, <laughs> That's exactly. not going to last when they're nine and they're 10. Right. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Now you have a little strategy that you use that you have used for yourself and that you use when you work with other designers. And we'll mention that you do have a designers Oasis membership program, but you use the strategy and you call it focus. And so you have the F is find your ideal client. O is own your niche. C call the noise. You understand your client's needs and S stay the course. You want to just run through your philosophy on each of these a little bit, Kate? Yeah, sure. Uh, so focus is an acronym that I, so my brain just works really well with visuals and graphics and acronyms and uh, that sort of thing. So um, I needed a framework to help uh you know, when I'm working with these designers, really stay focused. I find that um, we can, and I'm, and I'm so guilty of this too, which is why I, I, I share this. We can often find ourselves distracted by shiny objects or another interior designer that's new in town or um, a new model of business or a new software or you know, how, how am I showing up on social media? You know, and there's so many good questions to ask and there are th lots of things that you can focus your time on, but the problem that I see, um, and that, that I've experienced myself, like I mentioned, is just this baseline of anxiety because you are focused on all the things all the time. And so I wanted to create a framework that helps people think about, uh, just remind them that you only have to focus on a few things right now. And so F is for find your ideal client. Um, so often we can, this is just about getting very specific about who your, your ideal client is and embracing that that person's going to evolve over time. Uh, so it means if you haven't revisited who your ideal client is for a little while, it might be time to go back. And um, because if you're creating services that aren't aligned with your ideal client's needs, then there's not going to be a, a connection there. So the O, the O is own your niche. So whatever that is, it's not being afraid to say no to something that isn't the right fit. Mm. Um, so I, I'm, I feel very strongly about having your niche and, and standing in that space and, and owning it. Um, so just as an example, when I first started out, I had come from the commercial world and there was a period of time where I was really on this fence about, do I really want to do residential or do I want to also straddle that line between commercial and residential? And I had to acknowledge eventually I didn't have the bandwidth to go between both worlds if I was just going to run a small boutique firm because mm. the messaging for a commercial client is going to look so different than the messaging for a residential client. Um, so that's when I decided, no, I'm not going to do commercial. I'm going to focus on residential. And then after that, okay, well, what am I going to do? Is this new construction? Are these remodels? Is this decorating? So owning that niche make your decision there, stand in that space and don't be afraid to say no if something isn't the right fit because closing that door just means that you're leaving the door open for the, the right fit. So then C is call the noise. So <laughs> <laughs> again, this is things like taking a break from social media, stop spending countless hours on webinars. So instead practicing kind of an 80, 20 rule of 80% doing and 20% learning. Mm. Um, I know there's lots of resources out there and I utilize them, uh, but there's a time and a place where you have to turn off the videos and start doing the work, picking up the phone and making the call, sending that email to try to get a new client, following up with past potential clients. Um, so that's what I mean by call the noise. And then uh, you is understand your client's needs. Um, really getting to the heart of not just like, okay, they're building a new house, they have number of bedrooms or bathrooms, but really understanding their needs from an internal standpoint. So how do they want to feel in this space? What are they struggling with internally? Is Are they feeling embarrassed about their space? Are they um, 
wanting to have a place where they can go away, be quiet and have creative space because they want to get back to painting or drawing or photography or whatever um, and giving themselves their own identities. And I'm using real examples from past clients. Um, so getting to the heart of your client's needs, not just from a physical logistics standpoint, but also to the heart of, of their needs. And then the last one is stay the course S is stay the course. So this is staying focused on your end goal. So stop chasing shiny objects that are distracting you from achieving your goals. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the Enneagram, but I'm an yeah. Enneagram seven, which I, I love being a seven. Um, <laughs> one of the good things is we have lots of ideas. Um, but if we're an unhealthy seven, we can sometimes have so many ideas that they become distracting or we have too many, um, you know, pots on the stove or whatever metaphor you want to use. Um, so I'm constantly getting bombarded with ideas and I have to be really disciplined about, you know, documenting that somewhere, uh, whether it's writing it out or putting it in a journal or something, but then just letting it kind of sit there for a bit and not chasing every idea that comes along. So one idea, for example, Luann, that I've had forever, and maybe one day I'll do it, but <laughs> I just recognized this is not what I need to be focusing on right now. So I've always had this idea because I did designer for day type services forever and they're a lot of fun, but it was to create a design studio on wheels. So essentially having this mobile design studio that I could take to a client's house and do a really like thorough deep dive design session with them for one, two, three days. Mm. Um, so Sounds like a lot of fun and <laughs> unique and I'm, you know, who knows, I might do it one day and by all means, if you guys are listening and you like that idea, go for it. I don't have a trademark. I just think it sounds fun, but I've had to tell myself, no, Kate, stay the course. Yeah, yeah, Stay yeah, focused yeah. on the things that are going to um, light you up, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's, that's the focus in a nutshell. <laughs> that's interesting. It's a, it's a great way. And I love that you utilize it yourself to keep yourself in line. And now you've started to share it with other designers. And you know, that, that mobile design thing reminds me of decorating den back in the day. Oh, yeah. Is that how they work? Yeah, pretty sure that it was uh, that type of thing. And, you know, all the years that I did the sales at Window Works, I always had a minivan, which I hated, um, but I had a minivan with no seats in the back. And I used to have all of the samples. I would, I literally had laundry baskets, like the, the rectangle short um, laundry baskets. Um, and it would be a whole laundry basket with sheer books stacked up. And then it would be satins. And then it would be cottons and linens. And then it would be prints. And then it would be a book, you know, a whole thing of stacked of trims. And then the vertical blind samples, because this was the 80s. And, you know, and then the pleated shade samples and all the things. And then a, bind, a, a, a laundry basket full of binders of hardware and random stuff, you know, and literally I could pull up to your house and we could do every window without me ever having to go back to the showroom. Like it was crazy. Makes sense to me. Yeah. It's very efficient. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So interesting, interesting. So good. But I love this, um, this acronym of focus and that you've figured out a way all of the details that you mentioned in each of these letters are all absolutely so sound. They're just great business principles to help you, you know, always keeping your business you know, on the on the right path and checking there you have you've built in here ways to check in with yourself to make sure you're covering all the bases. It's all great, really good. And so this is what you do in this designers oasis. This is a membership program that you have, Kate, where you are mentoring and helping and teaching other designers to keep their business in focus and on the straight and narrow. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's exactly exactly it. So it's you know, really a response to recognizing that there can be a lot that we feel like we need to focus on. And the biggest thing that I hear from my fellow, from my peers is, I don't know what to focus on right now. Mm. I just need clarity around that. Yes. So, you know, creating a, a space to take them on this success journey um, to help them get clear on these are the things you need to prioritize right now. That is, I would agree with you. That's probably the biggest question that I hear from designers as well. I don't know what to focus on right now. So curiously, when you're working with a membership like you have, where you have, you know, dozens, if not way more than that, designers working together, is there a one-on-one -on -one component? Because for each person, it's in a different space. Or are you teaching the tools and the tactics for them to ascertain that information for themselves where they should start? 
Sure. So inside the membership, there are three courses that they're called define, create and attract. And they've got subtitles, but these are the fundamental building blocks of your business. So anybody that's in the membership can go. And I highly recommend starting here because there's, I see this just using a, using a simple example of somebody struggling with their website. It's like, well, of course you're struggling with your website because you haven't identified what sets you apart from another designer. You Mm. haven't identified who your ideal client is or your ideal client's too broad or you haven't, you know, really clearly defined your services and these other things. So you need to go back to square one and this is how to do it. So those are sort of self-paced ways of getting through this content and like checking off those boxes. Like, yes, this decision leads to this decision, leads to this decision so that it takes you down this decision making path and they all build on each other. Um, I do offer outside of the membership and at the time of this recording, it is currently paused, but I don't know when this will air, if it'll be back. I do offer one-on-one mentoring too, where if somebody does feel like they need more of a tailored approach specific to their business, they can work one-on-one with me, but by and large, I've created these, um, uh, the membership with these courses inside, which also has a live Q and a every month too, to get like, you can expand on these in a group setting as well inside the membership. But this is defined, excuse me, designed to be more self paced because these are the questions that I hear over and over and over again. So, um, that's, that's the membership in a nutshell. I love it. I love it. And so we are, you know, we're talking uh, spring of 2021. The show will probably be up, you know, in a couple of months or whatever. And you are relaunching in July of 2021, correct? That's correct. Okay. So where do people go, Kate, if they want to learn about you and be aware of this next launch of yours for the Designers Oasis? Absolutely. So designersoasis.com is the best place to start. Um, right off the bat, we there's a blog and there's weekly free work, free resources that are sent out. So right away, you can jump in there. Um, I'm excited we recently created collections. So this makes it easier to, for designers to find support in the areas you need it. So, so much content there that's free that's available right away. Um, the membership will open in July and that'll be the best time to join where you'll have access to these courses. You'll have access to the monthly uh, live Q and a, which is essentially like a group coaching session. Uh, we also have guest experts come and then a private community. So designersoasis.com is the best place to, to access that. The thing that will be different in July uh, from the way I've launched this previously is previously I have, I also have these master classes and previously they were only available inside the membership. What will change come July is that the membership and the master classes will be available either together or separate. So if you just want to do the master class and there's about four or five of them right now, there'll be about seven by the end of the year, you'll be able to access just that. Mm. Um, But if you want that engagement and that, um, uh, ongoing support. You want to f- access those really fundamental building blocks with the those three courses I mentioned earlier, and um, that's all in in the membership. So this gives designers a little bit more flexibility, and then it will be available uh, in an evergreen format, ongoing uh, after the launch. But if you're listening to this before the launch, that we're going to make that like the best time uh, to to take advantage of it and and get in there. Okay, sounds great. I love it. I have to say, Kate, it was great getting to know you. Really love to hear that transition. And, you know, it's not easy. It's just not easy. The differences, the phases in the different seasons of our life to realize one is closing and another one is starting. And then what does that look like when the next one starts? But you've landed on your feet. It's really, it's, it's, it's terrific. I'm, I'm, you know, congratulate you on it, really. (laughs) <laughs> that's a huge compliment to hear somebody say you've landed on your feet Kate. <laughs> I mean, you know we it's uh it's it hasn't been an easy journey and I just want to say you know for anybody that's listening to this who um maybe is experiencing imposter syndrome or feels like they don't have what it takes or they don't come from a, a background that you know is going to you know, and I'll just quickly say, because we don't need to go down this unless you want to, but I grew up, you know, in poverty with a single mom, experienced homelessness at a point in my life. And I just want to say that if, 
if I can do it <laughs> and do it well, if, if you have the power and the drive to go for it, you can do it too. And I just hope to be a support because I absolutely love the design community. Um, we at Designers Oasis is just a group of big hearted interior designers. I'm so grateful to have them in my life. And um, Luann, your podcast has uh, been a tremendous resource and asset to me and my business and my life and all the wonderful people you've brought on. So yeah. I'm grateful that you are, are doing this uh, for the design community as well. Thank you. Well, it's my great pleasure to do it. I love doing it because then I have awesome conversations with smart ladies like you. So um, I'm, I'm so glad that you came, Kate, and you shared all of this with us. And it is, it's if you can do it, then you know what, overcoming the things that you've overcome, I encourage each of you to look at Kate's website and to read a little bit more about her. She, and you'll know that if you're saying to yourself, yeah, but like, I'm sorry, you may not have as many <laughs> buts that you would have had in your path that Kate has had to go through. So thank you, Kate, for sharing all of this today. Thanks, Leanne, for having me. I am just so consistently impressed by the dedication and the hard work of each of the amazing designers that we have on this show. And Kate is certainly no exception. For her, launching her own business wasn't a luxury, right? It was a necessity. She loved her job in the commercial design firm. She was learning a lot. She was working at the top of her game. And from a work standpoint, she was thriving. She had her baby, took her maternity leave, and expected to transition seamlessly back into working mom mode. But she was shocked to discover that that life wasn't for her, okay? It's, it's, you never know, okay? You've heard me talk about my own daughter, Christy, and her struggles with postpartum depression. It's something that's not easy to describe. It's something that's not always easy to understand, especially when we're on the outside looking in. And it's something that we're not normalizing enough, right? We're not talking about it enough and we're not making it okay to talk about enough. I shouldn't say that. Little by little we are. That is the whole point. But it's a call to action now to look around and to look into the eyeballs of these women that are coming back to work and like are they okay? Okay, right? And Kate was never, you know, diagnosed with postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety. But the thing is, she did suffer from extreme sleep deprivation. And this created a lot of anxiety. And this is no joke. I mean, this isn't just like, I'm tired, I need a nap, right? We're not talking about the new normal parent tired here. She was pulling 50 to 60 hours a week with little to no sleep. And she was trying to hide it at work so that she could get their job, her job done. I mean, that's admirable in one sense, but in the other sense, think about an, a world, an environment, a business climate where somebody feels like they have to hide that, right? That kind of isolation is what already makes difficult postpartum times even more difficult, that loneliness, you have nobody to talk to. And you just don't know if you can keep picking up the pieces and moving on without something changing, right? So Kate ended up making very big change. And she started her own business. At the time, I might have said, <laughs> that's not so easy either, right? No, right. But I mean, on her own terms now, right? And I love that it all stemmed from the conversation with her husband on a walk. One of those, well, what if this really did happen conversations, right? Then it snowballed into an entire business plan. They really laid out what she could change, how much she could work, how much she could make. And then suddenly it was clear that that was what Kate needed to do. All right. Kate really has me thinking about maternity policies, work in general, and adapting business expectations for new parents. If you remember just recently, Jenny Madden, episode 654, she shared her input and her experience on the navigating maternity leave, not just as an employee, okay, but as an employer. She raised the question to us, what kind of boss do you want to be? Okay, we face this at Window Works at well, it's not easy to navigate to make sure that your employees feel cared for and nurtured as they go through these big changes in their life. But it is important to think about. And I, I like I said, when you really hear somebody like Kate describe what her day to day was like, and when I think back and what Christy described, it really does make you start to say, 
what will you do as an employee to help your employees succeed rather than fail? What can you do to make it easy for them to stay and feel supported? All right. I'm not saying that I've got the answers, right? But I am saying that the questions are important and it's time. All right. Kate ended up in a great place. She launched her firm, which saw fast success and has continued to grow and thrive. But not everybody's story turns out so well. So many new parents are having to choose between career and family. It isn't an easy decision. And if you have employees, please be cognizant of that. All right. Think about what policies you can put in place to help to help them and give episode 654 with Jenny a listen if this is all ringing bells for you. OK. And a big part of Kate's success has been sticking to her course and staying focused on the right things. That, of course, is so much easier than said than done. Right. It's something I hear with my own coaching clients all the time. What do I focus on now? How do I prioritize? And that's what let, led Kate to forming the designer's Oasis, her membership program where she helps you get clarity on how to define, create, and attract the core facets of a successful business. I love the idea of this membership, the way that she has designed it to be self-paced and to meet you wherever you are in your business, whether you're just starting out and have really little no, no, little or no idea what to do, or you're just stagnant and ready to grow, but maybe you've hit a wall and you can't figure out how to progress. You can learn about the program at Designer Oasis dot com designer oasis.com it's relaunching july of 2021 just around the corner great opportunity if you are in need of something like this for you and your business and this is hitting you know bells and whistles for you okay um and i just have to say speaking of resources kate's focus F-O-C-U-S plan that we mentioned in the episode is a goodie for you, okay? This is her framework for staying focused and succeeding in your business. You can go to luannnigara.com forward slash goodies, G-O-O-D-I-E-S to download it, okay? If you've already signed up for our goodies, then it's there in the portal for you. All right. Um, and I just want to say thank you to Kate for sharing your story with us and for being vulnerable and sharing your insights on overcoming the struggle and blocking out overwhelm and, you know, really creating that space for yourself and your clients and for figuring out a way to stay the course on the way to being successful. So congratulations. All righty, guys. Thank you tons for listening today. I um, hope that you are having a great week and I hope that you decide to be excellent. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one -on -one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.